Hello, my name is Maddie and I'm a second year creative producing student at East 15 Acting School in Southend. I've lived here most of my life and absolutely love history. My two friends, Serena and Eli, are not originally from this area but they were keen to find out more. So I sent them on a quest to find out interesting things about Southend and the surrounding areas and thus Hearing Back was born. Over the next couple of weeks we'll each be bringing a topic to the metaphorical table to discuss and find out something new and hopefully interesting. So Eli, what have you got this week? I looked at the uh, South End Pier, you know, the reason why our podcast is named Peering Back. I specifically kind of looked at its history and how it's been on fire a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's kind of a famous thing about the South End Pier, but basically it's been on fire, I think, like five or six times. <laughs> like a lot. It was just on fire in 2005. The bowling alley burnt down at the end of it in 1995. In 1976, a fire destroyed the pier head. In 1959, a fire destroyed the pavilion at the shore end. It was closed during the war. And then in June 1931, a woman fell on the tracks of the tram railway and was killed. So it closed the entirety of the war afterwards. Oh my goodness. I know. She fell onto the tracks and was run over by one of the electric trams. There were 500 workers and family members and people on the bridge who were there when it happened. It was built in 87, so it's 1887, that is. So it's. I thought it was, actually. Yeah, it's super old. It used to have sort of a Brighton-style, like, huge building at the front of it made of glass and everything, like resort towns at the time, but basically that burned down. (laughs) Uh, that That was in 1959 though yeah it was replaced in 62 by a bowling alley that was also burned down and now it's just open decking in the same area during the second world war it was actually used by the military so it was an acquisition by the royal navy and the pier itself was renamed to the hms lee as in like leon c and then the surrounding areas renamed hms westcliff basically it was to throw off people so the idea is that you would name the area hms HMS so that you would have official documents saying like this ship launched from the HMS Lee instead of actually saying where all the convoys are leaving and over the course of the war they had over 3,000 convoys comprising over 84,000 vessels that departed just from the South End Pier and that's how it became a center for the Coast Guard and the lifeboats that get sent out from there and so it was home to a lot of military ships during the Second World War which is pretty interesting. When you say it was called HMS and still be on land the naval bases did used to be called HMS because they were if you like a land bases because you get HMS <laughs> Daedalus is where the Royal Navy used to train I don't know if they still do huh, yeah so they're still called as if they were a ship but they're static on land wow yeah I'm not sure if you guys knew this as well the Liberty ship the SS Richard Montgomery sank off the coast of uh, South End Beach and you can still see it at low tide And it was basically a major cargo ship that was outfitted with a lot of guns and it sank with several thousand tons of explosives. So it it continues to pose a threat to like navigation in the surrounding area to this day just because of people having to avoid an actual sunken military ship in the estuary that they never removed. Wow. That's fantastic. (laughs) <laughs> well, not fantastic for anyone. Well, no. but, you know, fantastic. But, you know, that history is still there. Yeah. In 1959, I kind of mentioned that fire, but the issue is that since the fire started at the pavilion and it was during the summer months, there were over 500 people at the end of the pier <gasps> who couldn't get back because there was a giant fire that was racing down towards them. And so they had to send out a fleet of boats to rescue them from that side of the pier. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. They even combat it with crop spraying air aircraft so like crop dusters because you couldn't get fire trucks all the way up the pier oh my gosh Mm. that's really interesting there's been like 30 million pounds spent on this pier that's just been in having it burned down and having it be replaced and having it burned down again (laughs) (laughs) the world's longest pier and it is one of the big iconic elements of south end so we really couldn't be without it could we no (laughs) no but that's probably why there's actually very little down there now because it's probably not worth it's burned so many freaking times yeah (laughs) one last thing apparently after the fire in 2005 a bunch of people went out and picked up charred pieces of pier and they turned up all over ebay really (laughs) yeah people were selling pieces of the pier i wonder how much 
much that went for? <laughs> I have no idea. There isn't much documentation on it. I'm surprised I even found out about that. Someone was jailed for it. What? Yeah, three people were jailed for fraud on eBay and were fined over 300,000 pounds. Whoa. Yeah, it wasn't good. Because it wasn't real bits of the pier? I don't know the specifics on it. They would take things and they take like flu vaccines or sunglasses or, you know, random pieces from a car boot sale. And then they'd say that they belong to Saddam Hussein. Basically, they'd just lie about pieces of items. What? Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> Wow. This was a couple of local guys. Yeah. Well, I never thought that, you know, the South End Pier would be in that same league as bits of the Berlin Wall or, you know, all those other <laughs> iconic bits. <laughs> yeah, they actually have a list of things that they sold. A couple of the notable ones was that a fake drug to combat bird flu. They had some stuff surrounding a local news story about a guy named Thomas Wildman, who's an ambulance paramedic. He was struck off the medical register after he tried to sell life-saving equipment because basically he stole things from the ambulance. And also they sold contact lenses, which should only be sold by or under the supervision of an optician or a doctor. And they basically just sold them out of the case. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh dear. Yeah, Maddie, what did you look at? So I was looking at Tilbury Fort. Oh, cool. Yeah, so Tilbury is in the borough of Thurrock, which is where Lakeside is, and that's where the Dartford Crossing is. So it's that kind of area. There's quite a famous fort there, and it was built in 1539 when Henry VIII decided to build forts along the estuary to protect London. This was in a capital D shape, but in 1588 it was then extended to make it into its now distinctive star shape which was designed by Italian engineer Federico Genabelli, which I think is a great name. So here is something that I found super, super interesting, and I never realised that it was quite so close to home. So <laughs> Queen Elizabeth I had stationed her troops here just in case the Spanish Armada had broken through the naval defences. And I'm sure that you will be aware of her incredibly famous speech. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. Yeah. She said it there in Tilbury. Huh. Yeah. Wow. I already knew the speech, but I never knew that it was actually pretty close to my hometown that she said it. So I thought that was insane, really. Yeah. It was used quite a few times with various wars. It was used during the Civil War and the garrison stopped to check every ship and if they supported Parliament, then they were allowed to continue towards London and come ashore. But if not, they were sent packing, sent on their way. And eventually it became less and less used as a military base. And in 1860, it was superseded by another fort, which was a lot bigger. But interestingly, in World War I, it actually shot down a Zeppelin. Wow. I'm not sure where it landed, but I know that they definitely shot one down, which I thought was quite cool. And in World War II, the soldiers' barracks were hit and nothing was left apart from the foundations but even though it's actually been around for quite a long time and through various wars and battles the only bloodshed that is recorded to have happened was during a cricket match no <laughs> apparently although some say this never happened but allegedly there was a cricket match in 1776 between Essex and Kent and according to a newspaper the London Chronicle the Kent team consisted of and I quote a man who should not have been there and a professional whatever that means <laughs> <laughs> that's the oldest trick in the book <laughs> well i know i know <laughs> Um, so the Essex team actually refused to play and facing the obligation to forfeit, one of the Kentish team ran into the guardhouse, seized a gun from, and again, I quote, an old invalid and <laughs> shot dead the Essex man. Well, an Essex man. <laughs> Not the Essex man. <laughs> the Essex man. No, I meant an Essex team yeah, player. Know. Of course. <laughs> so because of this, everybody then rushed to grab guns, easily overpowering the four soldiers on duty. And again, I quote, fell to it doing a great deal of mischief. Wow. 
I mean, that, that just, that's self-explanatory, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this included running the invalid through with a bayonet. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Took it to another level. <laughs> They also killed the sergeant of the guard as he attempted to restore order. When was this? 1776. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, literally 1776. I mean, that was a dramatic year for everyone for a number of reasons, but... (laughs) (laughs) And eventually the Essex team fled over the drawbridge and the Kentish team made off with their boats, but a search was being made after them. Apparently, wow. according to this I mean, newspaper, they fled yeah. the scene after bayoneting an invalid. Yeah. So whether wow. that was the man who should not have been there or the professional, I'm not sure. <laughs> what have you been looking at this week Serena? I thought I'd go for something a little bit more contemporary this week and cinemas Hmm. and it seems that some of the cinemas in Southend and the surrounding areas did start out as theatres and then went into brief periods where they became cinemas and then some were demolished some other endings became car parks there's one that on Tyler's Avenue cinema uh, became a car park to a pub um, oh, no. when yeah, it closed yep yeah, that closed down in 1929 so the first major one that I found quite a lot about was the Hippodrome in the Gourmont Theatre that became a new cinema in 1934 in February 1954 the rank organisation and I don't know if you've ever seen one those films from the 50s and 60s where they had the guy who bonged the big symbol Mm -hmm. so that was sort of a big film company so it was actually the filmmaking organization that took over the cinema in february 1954 there's the warrior square picture theater that opened up in 1914 and it became a cinema in 1920 so if we go back to 1920 when there were the silent movies theaters added to the ambient of those silent films where somebody would play an organ or a live music to the films so that is sort of part of the reason I guess that a lot of theatres became cinemas especially when the talking movies came out because people's idea of entertainment was changing that's interesting I really didn't know that there was a cinema around Warrior Square is that where the swimming pool used to be was it that area Hmm. It's where um, the shopping complex, it's all shops now. And it's still interesting that Southend has still retained a need to have two theatres and a big eight screen cinema all within the town centre confines, really. And there was also, uh, you've mentioned before as well, Maddie, that the Curzel had a cinema for a period of time. Mm. And again, I think that's down to those iconic buildings being used for something that people want to go to for more enjoyable things rather than see them turning into shops. Yeah, I agree. And the Garrens Imperial on the High Street in 1921, a big estate organ was installed. And again, that was to play along with the silent films. Mm -hmm. And in 1927, that organ was then taken to St Luke's Church in Southend. So it just seems as though it goes in the opposite direction for what you'd normally see an organ now maybe come out of a church and put, you know, in, into a place of entertainment <laughs> to, to sort of kind of cling on to that history. Whereas back then it was like, oh, right, we finished with it now in the cinema or the theatre. We're going to put it into, into a church now. Yeah. And it had sound equipment installed for the first talkie. The first talkie there was The Wolf of Wall Street. Street, starring George Bancroft and Nancy Carroll and it opened on 14th of October 1929. The interesting thing was is that cinema during the intermissions there was a fountain in that cinema. Fountain? Yeah, <laughs> fountains yeah. During the intermissions at each side of the screen fountains would come up sort of send out jets of water about three <gasps> foot high with illuminated coloured lights and oh um, wow yeah so I want fountains in my Odeon <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> 
So when you think of theatres and cinemas and all the electrics that are going around and having water, <laughs> back in the sort of 1930s, 40s, 50s, I could never have imagined that ever happening. That cinema also had a pride of place organ. It was a Christie organ and they removed it and put it in St Stephen's Church in Prittlewell. So it, it's another piece of entertainment musical feature that's gone from a place of entertainment into a church hmm. i liked the aspect of putting fountains in there um there's that <laughs> the one. idea of an intermission in films because sometimes you really need a wee <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think lawrence of arabia has an intermission in the middle of it if i'm not mistaken there's a few old films that you can still watch that have like you know timed yeah. intermissions with them <laughs> well, i think pretty Jitty bang bang did yeah and yeah that- And actually, uh, you know, when I first used to go to the cinema for Saturday morning pictures, we did used to have cartoons on. We had people that used to go up on stage and do the balloon tricks. And then you'd have a little bit of a feature film, a cowboy film, or, you know, some of those kind of films that were about an hour to an hour and a half long, if you were lucky. So that it was a complete package. Mm. And, And initially, some of the big blockbuster movies did have a, an intermission in the middle you used to get that feeling before the intermission that you really fancied a hot dog or you really fancied some popcorn and you know you don't know where it came from and they used to slot a slide in the films oh subliminal messaging I, I believe it's illegal now so they can't do it, it but, is. Um, yeah. that was one of the reasons of having an intermission going back then and then I think it got to the stage where people wanted to go and see the film all the way through they didn't want to stop start kind of situation so but another interesting area in um, south end is around 22 alexandra street that seems to have had a few different theaters or cinemas based at that site and if we go back to sort of the early 1920s you had the riverley theater there and it then became the riverley cinema that opened in 1920 with a seating capacity of 1500 which is quite a lot for a a cinema Mm. and there were two balconies and there were family boxes a live organ played music again in that cinema it hosted films such as the original Hunchback of Notre Dame Ben-Hur a big classic and the cinema was upgraded to the time of the talkies in 1935 and it became part of a union circuit group and then eventually taken over by ABC cinemas. The cinema was closed in 1961 to go through a refurbishment so it carried on as the ABC for a while there and again it went back to being a theatre in 1998. It's those kind of buildings that have the architecture and the auditoria that gives really good sound, I I guess, as well, that can go either way, depending on where the audience of the time is sort of flocking to, really. Um, That was the the New Empire Theatre, because you said that's 22 Alexandra Street, because there's nowhere else on this street that's... Because the other side, I think, has always been kind of shop house kind of situation so it must be there so that's interesting didn't know that it was a cinema before it's interesting that the theatre closed and bailiffs called in because the rent wasn't paid on that site and that the building just fell into disrepair and it was really badly damaged by fire so many of these old buildings that were theatres it seems as though it's a fire that usually takes them away because nobody wants to let go of a building Mm. that has that sentimental value of performance in one shape or form. Yeah. You wouldn't expect a cinema to go back to a theatre because because of the popularity, especially of talking pictures. Um, You expect it to be on a sort of steady climb up to making the cinema bigger and better kind of thing. Yeah, and it just seems as though there were earlier theatres and cinemas that were demolished if things didn't work out or that turned into snooker halls when snooker and pool became quite or more fashionable in some areas. All of this was recorded on Zoom, so apologies for the mic quality. But thanks for listening and join us next week to find out what else we discover about Southend.